Hello, and a very warm welcome to everyone here. Um, and it proves to be, it's going to be an interesting session here with stories from um, education sector in Uganda, from looking at uh, family planning in the Philippines and looking at the health sector in Tanzania. Um, I'm going to hand over to the presenter shortly, but a few just housekeeping rules. I'm sure you're aware that the recording is taking place. Um, so just highlighting the fact there. Also on the question and answers, we're going to leave it to the end of the three presentations to do the questions, um, but feel free to post them in the chat. Um, and then just to the presenters, um, and Monica is up first. Um, I will just interrupt 12 minutes just to say, you know, that time is there, um, that you've got kind of three minutes to wrap up. Um, each session here is get each presentation here is going to have 15 minutes because there's three sessions and hopefully that will leave us with you know, about 10 minutes at the end. Okay, so um, Monica, do you want me to share the screen or are you happy to share it? Thank you, Elaine. Please go ahead and share the screen. Okay, and this is just in terms of um, issues around interconnectivity. Interconnect um, um, so I'll just start it from um, the first slide there. Okay, and over to you, Monica. Thank I'll you. I'll turn on very... to my video. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elaine, and um, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to you all. Um, my name is Monica Amuha, and I'm presenting um, the DHIS2 data use cases in Uganda. So my presentation basically will highlight the data use cases in Uganda, but prior to that, I'll give a brief background of EMIS in Uganda and the strategies that we use to implement um, DHIS2 for EMIS. So just a background briefly, um, EMIS in Uganda is centrally managed by the Ministry of Education and Sports um, at the headquarters. And as you can see in the picture, the ministry is responsible for printing and distribution of the annual statistical forms which are then filled by the schools and then the schools send them to the districts for approval. And once these forms are approved, they are relayed back to the ministry headquarters where data is entered, validated and analyzed. And this has been done in an, a standalone access database system. Then the ministry goes ahead to produce um, the statistical year abstract books that are in hard copies and then they are shared with the districts as well as schools and also um, the education development partners. And this whole process from data collection to production of these statistical yearbooks takes um, uh, around a period of around six to nine months. So this whole time, um, the districts and the schools lacks evident uh, based uh, lack timely data for evidence decision making due to the delayed feedback in relaying the statistical yearbooks. The districts also, as you can see, they are left out of the data management process because they only approve the field questionnaires. And this process um, was an, is annually done and it was last done in 2017. So between 2017 and now, and to date, we've had frequent data calls from the ministry to the districts to gather additional data to inform ongoing planning. Thank you. Next slide, please. Next slide, Elaine. Oh, sorry, did I, sorry. I went back <laughs> sorry. up? Yep. Thank you. Uh, so what strategies did we employ in um, implementation of the DHIS2 for education in Uganda. Our focus has largely been on the decentralized approach. So we focused at the district level where we revised the district education management information system uh, using the DHIS2. Initially, the DEMIS module um, is currently non-functional and was not linked to the standalone system at the central level. So the DHIS2 came in to support this since it's web-based and um, 
could be able to link data from the district to the central level. We went ahead to empower the district teams to be able to use their data and manage their data at that level, as well as the Ministry of Education team to be able to support the district uh, implementations. Then we had various stakeholder engagements for buy-in and scale. And important to note here is that um, we collaborated with Save the Children Uganda. We are collaborating with them, uh, an existing education development partner already working in the education sector. Several presentations were also made to the ministry technical working groups, the permanent secretary, the ministers, as well as the district leadership for buying. And we are having continuous engagements with partners such as World Food Program, Planning International, UNICEF, for continuous buying and scale up of DHIS2 for education beyond the four districts we are implementing in right now, as well as continuous resource mobilization to scale that, that project to other districts. So we also had a uh, capacity building for a um, multi disciplinary team at the district level. Unlike the health sector, the district, um, the, unlike the health sector, the education sector does not have designated data managers. So we've had, uh, we had to train the district education teams, the district planner, the ICT, to be able to use um, this system as well as generate data for their own decision making and planning at that level. So we also brought in the district health data managers that have been using the DHIS2 in health for over 10 years to share their experience and stories on how the DHIS2 has supported them in health in management of health data. Then we also trained the Ministry of Education central level team uh, to support the system as well as harmonize their central level data needs. So these were very various departments such as special needs, gender, statistics, and all these came together and harmonized their, their data needs. And now we are having routine. Um, we are going to have more routine data collection vis-a-vis -vis the annual statistical data that comes in once a year. Then lastly, we went ahead and uh, set up the districts, we customized, um, we set them up with computers, shared wireless internet, procured pro printers and storage cabinets, as well as printed the data collection tools for them to be able to enter data into the customized DHIS2. Next. So um, what are the data use cases? Through this, uh, we've been implementing the DHIS2 for education in Uganda since uh, 2019. And over this time, we've seen very interesting cases and use cases coming up from the districts as well as the central level. The first one is that data has been used for evidence decision making at district level. As you can see from all these uh, pictures is that we are having stories coming in from the districts telling us how they've used their data from the DHIS2 for education. So they've used the data for planning, for budgeting at district level. We have enrollment data that is entered into the system being used to inform allocation of capitation grants to the various schools. And then we also have um, the districts use this data for resource allocation based on the performance of the indicators in the system. So construction of classrooms, toilets, procurement of desks, allocation of teachers is all based on the performance of these KPIs. And then as you can see in one of these and the dashboards, we have a scorecard here where we are having um, different districts, where we having uh, a districts be able to visualize performance at different schools or even the central level visualize performance at different districts. So this enables um, targeted and targeted monitoring and support supervision. This abstract here is from one of the districts telling us how they actually used the data to inform renovation of classrooms as well as construction of teacher uh, houses. Next. Um, then the, 
the second um, use case has been that this data has really informed implementation of health programs, especially at district level. But of course, this also translates to national level. The data from the system, especially the enrollment data, provided vital statistics for immunization targets. We had um, the measles rubella immunization campaign, a nationwide campaign that took place in 2019. And the districts where we are implementing, we are able to provide us with, uh, to provide vital statistics for immunization targets so that appropriate vaccines would be allocated to them. Then of course, uh, since the data is age specific, um, it gives, um, learners who are eligible for HPV vaccination. And so this also informed that immunization program, as well as which learners are eligible in pre-primary schools for the deworming program. So this has really empowered um, the cross-sector synergies between education and health and data sharing between the two sectors. Then, of course, as we all know, we've been affected by the COVID pandemic. Also in Uganda, we had a lockdown last year in March and all learners were sent back to school. So we went ahead to do a national data call. As you can see from this dashboard, we have um, we collected data from all 140 districts across um, the country. And this data was used to inform uh, the COVID response to guide the ministry as well as the districts in distribution of self-study materials, deep distribution of temperature guns and masks during school opening. The districts were also able to use the data for additional uh, lobbying for additional partner resources. And right now, since we are going into the, we are into the vaccination program for the COVID-19, we've updated the teacher information into the COVID e-registry. And now this is going to also inform vaccination of teachers. So as you can see, all this data is informing planning, is informing decision-making at all levels um, across the sector. This is an abstract from uh, one of the districts also indicating that teacher information was extracted from the system and then the teachers were supported with food items such as maize flour and beans uh, during the lockdown. Next slide, please, Elaine. Um, and then uh, beyond now, during beyond the COVID pandemic, COVID response, uh, the schools now during um, the end of towards the end of the last year, the schools were reopened, and so we needed to do a school, COVID school surveillance. So this prompted us now to start the COVID school surveillance using the DHIS2 for education, and this is in partnership with Save the Children, and it's being piloted still in the four districts that we are implementing in with plans of scale up to the entire country because this is vital as it provides statistics relevant for the response. So just briefly, um, at the school level, learners and teachers are screened. And then this data, key data on temperature, runny nose, sore throat, difficulty in breathing is um, recorded using short codes. And then this data is entered uh, in a toll free SMS based reporting system. And then, of course, we have the real time dashboards, both at national and district level. So this data is linked also to the district health teams that are responding to COVID for follow-up and action in case it's out of the normal. For example, if we have um, a school that has reported uh, learners or teachers that have temperatures above 37 or difficulty in breathing, they are followed up to see whether they were referred to a health facility or treated. Yeah. Just to let you know, you've just um, less than three minutes to go. Okay, thank you. Um, so, and then the other one, uh, the other use case has been improved data visualization and display at both district and um, 
the national level. So from the system, we are able to generate very dynamic dashboards uh, with key education indicators at the district. They're able to print out and at a snapshot, they're able to view their data. Then at uh, the central level, we've uh, provided the central level um, ministry with smart screens and they are able to display this data and really guide them in decision making. Next slide. And then um, also the, what we did uh, within the DHI is to not everything, not all the data is collected on the annual statistical form. So we went ahead to uh, integrate data from other existing systems such as population statistics from the Bureau of Statistics to help us calculate key indicators such as gross enrollment ratio, net enrollment ratio. Then we also imported examination data uh, from the National Examination Board for calculation of the performance index. So all this now is, is visualized in one dashboard uh, within the DHIS2 and is able to be acted upon. And lastly, um, the DHIS2 for education is helping us in the process of harmonization of the institutional inventory master list. It's acting as a central repository for all registered and licensed institutions in the country. So with this, we are going to have continuous update and standardization of the master list based on the EMIS policy. And of course, we know that this master list is very vital for the Ministry of Finance in allocation of capitation grants to institutions. Next slide. So lastly, I will end with a quote from one of our district planners, Mr. Omal David, who says, because the political leadership look at their constituencies, just a minute, Sorry. <laughs> because the political leadership look at their constituencies, but for us, we look at service delivery versus performance indicators. With DHIS2, we are no longer arguing. We just bring the data and the politicians will say, okay, let's put the school here, the borehole there, the toilet stances there. So this shows that they are really empowered to use their data. Thank you very much. Sorry about that, my phone went off to interrupt you. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you. This I'll is stop to sharing. Of partners. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I don't know why my phone won't stop ringing. This is a very thank good you. example of how cross sectoral data use can work. So thank you so much, Monica. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, fantastic, fantastic examples there, Monica. Um, I think Hayden, an um, awful lot of um, hard work and as Kristen mentioned, great cross-sectoral examples there. And there will be another session on education as well, um, where we can follow up on questions. So if some of you, you can post questions if you have for Monica in the chat now, and we'll see if we can get them towards the end of the session. But I'd like to now hand over to Adam and Phoebe, if you could, um, share your screen and again likewise i'll just um time you from the 12 minutes and let you know at 12 minutes great okay, thank so you over to you adam starting and then he'll hand over to phoebe great right. well welcome everyone uh, to our presentation uh using dhis2 to support learning in family planning <clears throat> My name is Adam Preston and I'm a digital health advisor within the International Development Group uh, at RTI. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, that'd be, okay, great, thank you. Just a little bit about RTI. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just, sorry, go, go back, I'm sorry, Fabi. Wanted just to quickly kind of go over uh, our presentation today, we're going to talk a little bit about who we are as RTI. I'm going to get into the, the project, uh, Reach Health. It's a family planning project in the Philippines. I'm going to look at uh, our MERLA framework that we're basing a lot of our, um, our work on that we'll be presenting today, and then go through some specific examples of how we're doing that um, and how we're using DHIS2 uh, within the project. Um, and then, of course, looking forward to our future plans um, to expand uh, 
our use of DHIS2. So a little bit about RTI. Um, <clears throat> we're the first tenant of Research Triangle Park, which is one of the first US research technology parks. We're founded in 1958 by three area universities, uh, state governments and local businesses to stem brain drain from the area. We're modeled after a technology park created by Stanford University that eventually evolved into um, Silicon Valley. All research activities are guided by our mission to improve the human condition. Health research is our largest and uh, single field of study encompassing research that ranges from studies of the human genome and the development of new drug compounds to national surveys of health behaviors and the implementation of global health programs. And that's where we're gonna start today. Uh, next slide. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Fabi, data manager on Reach Health, to share a little bit more about the project and how we're using DHIS2 to support learning and family planning. Fabi? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. My name is Fabi Javelin Diwayan. I am the data management specialist for USAID's Reach Health project. RTI International, in partnership with uh, Johns Hopkins Center for Communications Program and Duke Global Health Innovation Center is implementing USAID's Reach Health Project. Reach Health Project is a family planning, maternal and neonatal health innovations and capacity building platforms project in the Philippines. Its goal is to reduce, I'm sorry, it's not working, uh, reduce unmet need for modern family planning, reduce rates of teenage pregnancy, and newborn morbidity and mortality. It has three objectives. The number one is to strengthen healthy behaviors through social and behavioral change. Second is to expand quality client-centered and respectful family planning and maternal child health care and services in underserved areas. And the third one is to institutional, institutionalize national, regional, and local systems and capacities to manage, implement, and sustain family planning and mater maternal child health programs in the Philippines. We have a total of 32 project sites composed of 18 provinces and 14 highly or or urbanized cities all over the Philippines. In order to improve the effectiveness of throughout the project, Rich Health utilizes the MIRLA approach. The MIRLA approach is the intentional application of results focus monitoring, evaluation, and research to inform continuous learning and adaptive management for improving program effectiveness and policy decision making. So this cycle of monitoring and evaluation, operations research for continuous learning and adapting best practices is being completed and repeated on a regular basis. One of the ways the MIRLA approach has been implemented is through the conduct of pause and reflect sessions to identify what's working and what needs adapting. Pause and reflect sessions are meetings where data collected by the project are analyzed, interpreted, and used as basis for decision making. So we have an internal as well as an external pause and reflect session. Prior to using the HIS2, the project has been using Excel and PowerPoint to process and visualize the data that is being collected. Um, so we enter data in Excel at the province and city level, and, that's, and then this will be submitted via email, and then it will be consolidated at the regional and national level. And then we will create the visualization in Excel and PowerPoint and disseminate the information via email and meetings like post and reflect sessions. This process is actually tedious because the data management process is fragmented. We, can, we use different tools for data collection and then consolidation and analysis and visualization. With the use of DHIS2, the time it took to process data has been considerably reduced and simultaneous access to data at all levels is now possible. So this is how we configure DHIS2 for the project's data management needs. The first data set that we have is the FHSIS data set. FHSIS stands for Field Health Service Information System. This is the encoding tool for routine health facility data. 
Prior to the use of BHIS2, the usual problem that we encounter are errors in data entry like negative numbers, having letters or symbols. In BHIS2, it limits the entry of incorrect values and it also lessens the processing time since consolidation is already built in. We also have an event program called Activity Database. This is the repository for all project supported trainings and reportable activities in order for us to map the technical assistance that was provided to the facilities and health, office, health offices. And just recently, we also created another event program for, which is called Rapid Feedbacking for Facility Monitoring Data. This um, um, event program allows us to visualize the coverage and initial results of the monitoring, for example, the stock out. From the data that we have entered in the different um, data entry and capture apps in the HIS2, we created data dashboards for our post and reflect sessions. I will now be sharing with you one of the key examples on how we are using the HIS2 for our post and reflect sessions. In February 2021, we have conducted a mid-project technical review, which involves a series of activities. So we, um, it, it includes a lot of activities like survey to understand the expectations for the pause and reflect session. And then afterwards, we had a pre-work session where we analyze data and identify the learnings. And number three is we had an action planning to identify adaptive solutions and dissemination of plans. DHIS2 data dashboards was used in the pre-work sessions in order for us to analyze current data implementation experience and core challenges. Um, what we did is that um, during the actual conduct of post and reflect session, we divided the participants into uh, several breakout rooms, and then we, they have to discuss uh, an indicator that was assigned to them. So in the discussion of the family planning current users and new acceptors indicator, we realized that it is a very good, uh, the HIS2 is a very, very conducive for pause and reflect session because it also allows fast modification of visuals to suit the needed analysis while the discussion is ongoing. So here are some examples of the learnings or technical discussions during the pre-work session for the technical review in Luzon. So as you can see, we talk about the major observations on the trend of the data of current users and new acceptors for family planning. We also talk about the major observations on the geographic differences of current users and new acceptors in family planning. And we also talk about the reasons on the trends and geographic differences. Afterwards, we also talk about our learnings from the monitoring data and also our learnings from the implementation. After the pre-work session, we again gather for another um, session, pause and reflect session, which will then focus on um, identification of adaptive solutions based on the um, pre-work that we have conducted. So here, I will also show you some of the examples of the adapt adaptive solutions that we have identified for the problems that we have uh, enumerated during the uh, analysis of the data. So for example, in lesson one, uh, COVID-19 created new challenges to health seeking behavior. We have identified that redesigning the USAPAN, it is an activity, a demand generation activity that directly links service delivery could be a very good um, um, adaptive solution. This was already completed by um, the team. And then second is to create videos on family planning methods to improve quality of family planning messaging and support of community health workers who can task shift. Task shift. This one is already ongoing. Second one is um, another um, common uh, problem that we have identified is that public and private service delivery points, either individually or as part of the healthcare provider network, cannot currently prioritize family planning service provision and recording and reporting. So the adaptive solution that was identified is to support the training and mobilization of community health workers in performing basic family planning tasks 
following informed choice and voluntarism principles during normal conditions and in health emergencies. This is ongoing. We have already conducted a training of trainers for the community health workers. Next one is um, number of private family planning service delivery points remain low. So uh, here are the adaptive solutions that was identified to conduct quarterly internal and external pause and reflect session to identify areas of improvement. This one, um, it's, uh, I put it in ongoing, but we have already conducted it this June, internal uh, pause and reflection for family planning in hospitals. And the second and the third, we set a realistic target for private hospitals and we advocate the revision of the uh, peers performance indicator reference sheet to require only three methods instead of five and focus on long acting reversible contraception for private hospitals. So in our latest version of AMELP, this has already been updated. So I just presented you uh, three sample lessons and the adaptive solutions that we have come up to um, for this presentation, but there are more. So yeah. thank you very much. Time. Thank you very much, Fabi and, um, and Adam. Yes. Okay. Can I discuss three minutes the left. last slide? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, here is the, um, it's the learnings from the implementation of the HIS2 itself. On configuring the system, we, we have to think uh, with the end in mind. How we build the data sets and program sets greatly affects what we can do or show in the analytics. So working with our technical advisors and program managers is very, very important. On capacity building, we have actually customized the training and user guide manual because we found out that using the actual data elements and indicators that the participants are dealing with at work facilitates the training process and makes it easier for the participants to understand the concepts being presented. And last but not the least is creation of a support group, create a platform where users and DHI's support team can reach one another for support. So for in the future, we will focus on enhancing the data dashboards to be used for post and reflect sessions to be conducted at the health facilities level. So I hope you have garnered something from the presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Adam, is there yeah. anything? Yeah, and thank you. Uh, we welcome all questions in the chat and feel free to reach out to us via email. And of course, we wanted to acknowledge USAID and our partners, Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs and Duke Global Health Innovation Center uh, uh, for making this work possible. So thank you. Thank you so well, thank much. You. Thank you very much. And um, Feb, you already has some po um, comments posted up in the community of practice. So that's also another way of continuing the conversation. So really nice um, um, example of kind of pause and reflect that I think is applicable in, in, in all sectors. So I'd like for the last um, session, just to hand over to um, Wilfred, who's going to present on Tanzania and focusing on the health sector. So Wilfred, over to you. And don't forget to keep posting your questions into the chat. <clears throat> Thank you, Elaine. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, that's great. Thanks, Wilfred. Yep. Yeah, great. So um, good morning, afternoon, and uh, evening, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Wilfred Signoni, and um, I'm a DHS2 implementer from his Tanzania. I'll be sharing um, our story on data use in Tanzania, you know, looking at the challenges, opportunities uh, presenting themselves in Tanzania, and how we kind of address, and a um, little bit about um, the plan which we have in terms of uh, the future. So um, a little bit about history of, uh, you know, uh, DHS2 and uh, health information systems in Tanzania. Um, DHS2 was uh, first adopted in Tanzania in 2011. Uh, 2014, we scale up um, nationwide to all the districts in the country. Um, so in 2021, we have like worth of seven years worth of data, you know, from all the health facilities, public and private. Um, different health programs have also been integrated within this uh, national system. 
so that we can have a holistic uh, kind of view. Of course, the data flow in Tanzania, you know, we you know that our health facilities are the most uh, um, point where they, you know, kind of produce this information. So these information are produced mostly there at the facilities. Um, still at the facility, they have a huge um, registers, you know, books in different programs and they, you know, collect this information and aggregate these and then send them to either the higher uh, administrative point where the DHS2 has been, you know, installed at the district or some of the facilities are also kind of uh, have capability and uh, our infrastructure where we have, you know, um, installed this DHS2 for data collection. Um, so we have um, kind of, um, you know, um, start, we started, you know, roll out DHS2 at the district level, but we, as years gone by, we have scaled it at the health facility so that this information can be captured at the health facilities. Now, most of these, uh, you know, uh, data managers are, are, are engaged routinely in getting this information to the DHS2. Uh, once this information are, you know, into the DHS2 now, either the regional managers, the health programs at different levels, and even the national level are, are, are able to access this information immediately. Um, and also, you know, review this information before um, different stakeholders and parental partners also get access to this uh, information. Uh, we are talking about, you know, more than uh, 100 million records, aggregate records here. I'm talking about, you know, um, more than uh, 2,000 users. Uh, you know, in, in the month, you have more than millions, 3 million records, you know, being populated within the system so that they can be analyzed. So. Uh, the challenge of uh, 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 availability of data is kind of diminishing and some other challenges are now cropping up in terms you know, of data quality and of course the, the information use. And this is actually the topic which we are, uh, I'll be kind of trying to present today. Now, uh, I've tried to kind of uh, um, split this um, um, overview of the data use in terms of two areas. One, I'll talk about challenges which we see kind of uh, emanating due to the, now the huge load of information which is available, uh, where we have now, you know, limited uh, local routines of data use at the different levels in the government, in the, in the, in the country. Um, you know, um, maybe too much emphasis has been put on the central level in terms of building capacity, but at the subnational level at the health facility, we have a very low limited out of uh, data use, still people are, are clinging to the, uh, you know, um, uh, legacy uh, systems which uh, they've been used to use, for example, Excel for the analysis instead of using this uh, uh, DHS2 web-based systems which we have. And of course, the low limited, um, you know, uh, skills in using DHS2. For example, today we have seen a very good a lot of, um, you know, data analytics tools within DHS2 where you can analyze your information, but you find that in, in most of these national systems, um, there's been low uptake of these particular advanced uh, data analytics tools. So these are kind of the challenges which I'll be bringing up, but also we see the opportunities which are coming up. There's a lot of innovations which are, are coming within the systems, uh, for example, uh, UNICEF, uh, we call these uh, UNICEF apps, but they are apps which allows or facilitate that analysis and use, for example, DNA, bottleneck analysis, scorecard, etc. We see also there are kind of, um, you know, local innovation in terms of dissemination of information to different uh, stakeholders. And I will talk a little bit briefly about the HMS portal, which we have in Tanzania. And of course, looking also uh, to the future in terms of how can we support uh, predictive uh, analysis uh, and, and those kind of things. Okay, so um, seven years down the road after a full rollout of DHS2, and here's the snapshot of how that is used uh, at the national system. This is kind of a snapshot. There's a feature in DHS2 where you can, you know, uh, see. Um, uh, the, the level of um, use of these analytical features within your, your DHS2 system. And this is something which I've kind of generated from our national system. And as you can see, there are different kind of reports, but the most uh, used uh, report is called data set report. Now, for those who don't know, data set report is just a report uh, which mimics 
uh, the, um, uh, the data entry collection form. And usually um, data managed back in the days, they were you know, um, aggregating this information. Once they've aggregated manually this information, they take this inform, uh, they, they, they enter this information, this uh, kind of uh, uh, report similar to the data collection tool and then send it to the uh, upper level for analysis. Uh, so seven years, you know, eight years, 10 years uh, after the you know, implementation of DHS2, we see that the, this kind of report is still the you know, most used report in the national. Uh, and it's used uh, you know, by far from the other uh, particular analytical tools. And this kind of begs the question of why, you know, a low level of uh, 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 data use or low level of you know, analytical skills at the low level where they kind of you know, still have that legacy um, analysis skills or you know the demand only to you know use the data set report and then send it to the higher level instead of engaging with you know more analytical functions which are in DHS2 um, so that they can use this information in, in their particular you know uh, uh, local level. We also see that the second uh, analytical tool there is the pivot table and uh, one we, we did kind of a research um, you know, one of the things which we uh, notice is that uh, the pivot table has been also quite being used extensively and not rather for, you know, local information use, but, you know, just to pull all this information outside of uh, DHS2, put them in Excel, you know, and then later on, you know, do their own, um, um, their own analysis using the Excel instead of using um, the advanced uh, tools within the DHS tool. So this kind of uh, brain brought uh, many questions. Uh, is it the capacity building for them to use these analytical uh, tools within DHS two, or uh, some of the DHS two uh, functions uh, are not, you know, uh, covering some of the local needs uh, which are there? But you know, there are some um, uh, uh, um, many reasons which we got, you know, for example, people are kind of uh, quite uh, conversant with Excel, so they decided to use that and, 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 and use this Excel in their reports. Uh, of course, some of the reason other ones, uh, they talk about, you know, uh, uh, the need, um, you know, to learn more about these uh, analytical tools. So it, it, it brings that particular aspect that uh, we, we still have a long way to go in terms of building capacity, exposing our national uh, team so that they can understand these fe features which we are actually building within DHS2 and, 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 and you know, you know uh, use this information, use DHS2 to inform them uh, during their particular meeting uh, instead of relying with, uh, with uh, either legacy uh, functionalities which they have um, um, or, 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 or other, other tools. Now, this, these are the pictures which um, we got when we, uh, we did a little bit of a research in one of the health facility. Um, I mean, it shows um, one of the disease surveillance officer who had, you know, uh, kind of designed some of the charts and then post them on their particular uh, uh, wall. Uh, now this, uh, we, we found this quite uh, interesting in, in terms that, um, you know, there's a, some level of information use uh, at, the, at the lower level, and this is at the facility level where they can use this information. The good part is all these information are coming from DHS2, uh, but uh, the, local, the local team there are very conversant, are more comfortable to extract this information, you know, and, and, and you know, kind of um, uh, draw them by pencil. I'm, I'm hoping you can see this pencil. They have a very nice case there where they hold these, uh, their, their kind of uh, color, color pencils and et cetera. So this, um, you know, um, inform us more that, you know, at the lower level, uh, there is a demand of uh, information use. However, um, the skills, uh, we have a limited skills and, and you know, um, we need also to promote the use of DHS to visualizations at the local level where they can actually use these uh, charts. We have, you know, been shown examples of uh, very advanced uh, uh, charts. And, and if these particular um, charts visualization can be kind of scaled to the local level, then this, uh, it will help much, first of all, our walls in our health facilities to not be clustered with all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, pictures, but, you know, uh, people could also use uh, 
some of um, um, some of the DHS to to support them. And you now, just have four minutes left, Wilfred. Okay. Okay, great. So um, uh, moving forward, um, some of the uh, we understand there's no one single activity which is sufficient to achieve you know last improving improvement in data use. Uh, so the team has been working in several interventions for promoting information use culture at different levels. One is the BNA, uh, bottleneck analysis. This is an evidence-based planning using uh, bottleneck analysis. This identifies you know, inequities, obstacles to effective health system performance, and also identify and document these root causes. Uh, on the right there, we have you know, different capacity building sessions, which we have kind of been scaling. This particular app, uh, this app was uh, built within uh, by his Tanzania and uh, his Uganda. There is also other app which is called Scorecard app. This is uh, one of the famous app. A lot of people are using it. You know, it's used for planning, decision making. This is something which we have done in Tanzania, uh, implementing it. Uh, you know, supporting the analysis at the high level and also at the sub national level. And some of the areas which we have worked on is, you know, with a BRN star rating, where we kind of uh, measure the performance of various healthcare facilities. We've also worked with a reproductive maternal newborn and child program, health program, where we've communicated the status of these programs towards key global, regional, and national indicators. We've worked also with the nutrition and also sanitation and hygiene team to support uh, this particular uh, uh, implementation of this scorecard. And of course, another um, intervention uh, which we've worked on is um, uh, uh, HMS National Portal, where we have extracted um, data, routine data from the national system, uh, pushed them to the portal each quarter by district level, and you know all the stakeholders within the country and uh, globally they could actually watch, uh, view this information, and you know. Um, 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 uh, I see them. We, we kind of uh, uh, developed this uh, from since 2017, and it's been kind of supporting um, um, a dissemination of the ministry uh, information from, you know, within to outside, so other people can also see it, but also, you know, catalog, communicate, um, you know, communicate the, uh, the progress which we're having, but also increase transparency and innovation within uh, stakeholders. So um, different interventions which we have also thought of uh, in terms of supporting uh, information use. One is the uh, capacity building. We know that uh, for data to be a routine part of the decision making, people at all levels should have skills to analyze, interpret, synthesize, present, and use this information. So the team has been working with building capacity at the uh, country level, at all levels, uh, with different skills. You know. Um, um, we, we have started at the national, we, we usually start at the national level and we are hoping that this uh, effort can be cascaded to the lower level. We've also worked with uh, health programs, you know, to kind of, uh, um, you know, focus on identifying the skills in, 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 in you know, these indica program indicators and etc. Uh, when we started the national scale, uh, we focus more on data entry, uh, you know, validation, but as the time has gone, we have now more focus on you know, data quality, information use, and, and promote you know, understanding what works and, and where does it work. We have also, um, we know that uh, data users need to know that they can trust the information on which they base their decision. When the quality is low, demand for uh, data decreases, that uh, data informed decisions making does not occur. So uh, as we expected, so we, we, we have been more or less also focused on improving, uh, you know, conducting these regional uh, data quality sessions where we have sit with the regions and districts, provide feedback to the lower levels on what um, the, the, the data quality issues. Uh, and then said we have worked with the WHO and Ministry of Health to build a district that we call, we call them a, a district data quality dashboard. We have also configured the WHO data quality app so that they can identify the outliers and, and these information are you know, propagated back to these districts. And then afterwards, uh, you know, they, um, we, we hope that these particular sessions can strengthen the data use at the lower level. We have also been conducting research on information use to understand what works for whom, why and where. Uh, we are conducting this research with the HIS network and other HIS groups, the knowledge generated from these uh, you know, research 
will be available locally and also within the community. And we share these experiences and scale the interventions which are successful in one point to also in another area. Uh, lastly, um, our future plans, I think uh, it's high time we, uh, we look about forward. We have been you know, using this information to understand um, uh, uh, you know, uh, retrospectively, but now we look about how we can use this information to do a predictive analysis uh, you know, using artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve the health service delivery. Uh, within the Tanzania. And this is an area where, where we are a little bit kind of interested uh, and we are exploring now to see how we can use this uh, uh, AI and machine learning to improve the uh, information use at the national level and also at the sub-national level. Thank you. Samson. Great, thank you very much, uh, Wilfred. Um, and before I go to the questions, we've just got a few minutes for questions. Um, I'd just like to reiterate something that came up in the chat. There is a, another an education session that will be will take place on Wednesday, so you can ask further questions on the use of DHIS2 in education in that session. There's also the Thursday plenary se session where we'll be looking at the whole concept of designing for data use, and we'll have sessions on thir Thursday after that, looking specifically at the denominator um, issue. So. Um, you can also post, as we said, in the community of practice where there's been some ongoing discussions. Um, but I thought it was quite interesting just looking at the chat there is um, one around um, from JK Osborne saying, is there a difference really between the two ministries in health and education? Have you noticed any significant difference? Um, so I was wondering, um, if you'd like to respond to that, I presume Monica, you'd be in the best place to respond. Have you found a significant difference between dealing with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health? Well, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I, I would say that, um, well, it, it, it's for government entities, um, it's more or less the same. There isn't a very big difference because you go through the bureaucracies to have the approvals and uh, yeah, and the buy-in. But then um, also the teams, there's a difference between the teams. If like, for example, in health, uh, they are more data-driven and uh, they've been using DHIS2 for a long time. So they are more receptive to new DHIS2 innovations vis-a-vis -vis in education, where now this is a new innovation that we are trying to introduce, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And I'm sure you can continue that conversation on the community of practice. Um, and the other question, and maybe this would be for Febby or um, um, Adam or Wilfred, is in relation to the e-learning or data use modules. What has your experience been with these modules at the national and district level? I guess particularly with COVID moving into more e-learning mode. Um, I don't know if Febby or um, Wilfred, you'd like to answer that? Um, may I answer the yes, question? Yes, Febby, go ahead. Yeah, we have actually conducted two trainings. The first training that we have conducted was an on-site training, in-person training. And then for the new uh, staff that we have, since there's already a COVID-19 situation, we have also conducted an online training. So we use Zoom in order to uh, conduct the webinar. And then we use Teams in order to monitor the outputs of the uh, participants. So in Teams, we, we put everything there, the resources, the instructions on how they're going to do the, um, the exercises, as well as the references like the uh, customized DHIS2 user guide manual. Mm -hmm. And we have also actually um, divided the, for the second training, we, di we divided the training into um, those who will be conducting the data entry. And then um, the second training will be more focused on analytics. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers yep. the question. And Wilfred, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a quite a difference between, you know, physical and, um, you know, 
digital um, you know, training and uh, yeah, we, we're think, all experiencing that, Wilfred. I didn't read the difference exactly. between the online <laughs> conference. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But uh, I think um, with uh, with what we are experiencing right now, I mean, uh, e-learning something which uh, is uh, would be more or less the way forward. And you know, mm -hmm. it's also easier to um, help. Um, the local, the local teams where they can also, you know, train themselves within, um, you know, their local pace and, and, and you know, mm. also do some kind of uh, in-house capacity building. Uh, the, the, the important part is to make sure that, you know, you have, you know, build these uh, modules as uh, effective as possible, as um, my colleagues also say, put a lot of, uh, you know, exercise so that they can train themselves and also retrain also the, the other staff when they are, you know, in, in, in their kind of area of working. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Wilfred. Yeah, I think it's something we're all experiencing um, going online is there's many opportunities and advantages to it, even though we might miss the face-to-face. -face. So, um, unfortunately, we've run out of time there. I just see some um, of the questions are coming up in the chat. Um, these will get transferred over to the community of practice. And if you engage then with each of our presenters on the community of practice in the, um, in the, in the community of practice, but also throughout the week within the social gatherings and also the sessions I already mentioned that we'll continue to have this week. So before I just finish, I just want to say a very warm thank you to all of our presenters for, I sorry, I rushed you to your, um, to, to decrease your kind of, all the work you've done to such a short um, uh, time space, but I think you all did very, very well. Um, so looking forward to continuing the conversation with you all during the week. Thanks very much.